Welcome to Hard Talk. I'm Stephen Sacker. Two months ago, Turkey's elected government managed to survive a botched military coup. A triumph for democracy? Well, not necessarily. Not if you regard freedom of expression and an independent judiciary as prerequisites of a genuine democracy. Thousands of judges, journalists, civil servants have been locked up or sacked since the coup. My guest today is Ege Temel Karan, a prominent writer and journalist who knows how difficult it can be to speak out in Erdogan's Turkey. Is silence the only option? Ejay Temel Kuran, welcome to Hard Talk. Thank you for having me. Let's start with what is happening in Turkey today and been happening for the last couple of months. Has it all, everything that's happened since that uh, attempted coup, has it taken you by surprise or not? The coup, it did. Uh, um, the things that happened afterwards, um, well, not really, because uh, Everybody is talking about if everybody has been talking about if this is a staged act or not, if this was a real coup attempt. Um, it your, was, your view on that? I think it was a real coup attempt. And, you know, in the Middle East, the things don't go the way we think they go. You know, the, the one who benefits from the incident is the one who creates the incident. That rule doesn't really apply every time in Middle Eastern countries. So. Uh, people thought that since Mr. President is benefiting from the situation, they, he might have, you know, staged this act, which wasn't the case, I think, mm. because his political career has been on, you know, built on this, you know, turning crises into opportunities since from the very beginning. So it wasn't surprising that he would uh, try to strengthen himself even more after the coup, and which was completely legitimate for in in many people's eyes at the moment. You mean legitimate for him to crack down as a result of the coup? Yeah. And when you use that interesting phrase, turning a crisis into an opportunity, it... Well, it, I mean, like, he's, he's, he's... I'm sorry to interrupt, but uh, he's... Possible. Don't worry, I do it all the time. <laughs> <laughs> you're, you're allowed to I'm just to trying it. to set some rules here. So maybe you don't... I mean, in the hope that you don't do it. Um, his uh, political career started uh, this reciting a poem, a certain poem, and then he was in prison and when he was out of the prison he was this very strong leader already and since from that time going on you know throughout his career he did the similar thing he turned crises into opportunities which is a uh, brilliant you've made a point thing. several times of, of repeating that poem it was I think in 1997 uh, after yeah. uh, a very complex sort of moment in Turkish political history. Yeah. Uh, another sort of attempted coup of a sort. And Erdogan was under enormous pressure and he addressed a crowd. And this is what he said in his poem at the time. The minarets are bayonets, the domes are helmets, the mosque is our barracks, the believers, infantrymen, the, divide, the divine army awaits my faith, Allah Akbar. Because you regard that as such a seminal moment, is it true, therefore, to say that you believe that Erdogan's career has all been of a piece, that from the very beginning he has been a man on a mission, and a mission which involves authoritarianism in the name of Islam? Well, I have been a critic uh, of this uh, government since from the very beginning. I am not one of those who loved this government in the beginning and then all of a sudden understood that there was some, uh, there were authoritarian inclinations in this uh, regime. So I would say that, yes, it was completely um, significant. It was obvious, it was apparent from the very beginning. And when you know Turkish history, it was supposed to be so. This government was supposed to be authoritarian. I mean, like, we have to go back to 1980 coup, which vanished all the leftist movement, all the progressive people. Uh, created um, millions of re uh, exiles, you know, and imprisonments, torture cases, and so on and so forth. And you were left with a very strong conservative uh, society, um, very much conservative society, 
and a very strong right-wing politi politics. So I would say that, you know, it's when you look throughout the time, uh, this government was outcome, or this Turkey, let's say, was, has been the outcome of 1980 coup. There, there are different brands of authoritarianism in Turkey's history, obviously. I mean, there's a, a strong yeah, strand using of... using every brand. <laughs> yeah, many, many brands. But, but here's just a few figures plucked out of the air from the last couple of months. 130 media organisations shut down since the coup. 45 newspapers, 29 publishing houses, 23 radio stations, 16 television stations, 15 magazines, three news agencies, all have in one way or another been interfered with, intervened with, or shut down by the Turkish government. Some are saying, some on the liberal secular side of Turkish politics are saying, this is worse, this repression is worse than we saw with the military dictatorships. Do you, do you say that? Well, I mean, like, it is uh, tragic that we are uh, with these two options only, either military dictatorship or this kind of oppression. Uh, so, uh, well, I don't want to make a comparison. Why not? Maybe because it is, uh, it's not the only option. It was, these are not the only no, options. No, but they're the two, two strands of your history, and it therefore is quite easy to make a comparison. I just wonder if you don't want to because no, you're No, it's not. Uh, well, I'm like... There are many dichotomies that has been uh, repeated by mainstream media about Turkey and one of them has been either military people or conservative right-wing uh, religious uh, authoritarian regime. That is not a right uh, way of looking at things because it applies, it assumes that uh, military is the secular body entity, therefore it's against the religious movement. It's not like that. In 1980 coup, after, after 1980 coup, it was the first time that military approved the obligatory religious lessons in Turkey. And actually, military, uh, the military uh, authority approved and supported actively uh, the religious movements and, you know, Fethullah Gülen movement, which is the alleged entity uh, responsible for this, uh, allegedly responsible mm. for this uh, latest coup attempt. Well, I, I understand what you're saying. You're making a plea for more sophisticated analysis and nuance in the way one looks Thank at Turkey. Much. Yeah, no, no problem. <laughs> but, but what I'm saying to you is, right now, Turks are being encouraged by the government to make a binary choice. I mean, Erdogan is essentially using the language, you may know, remember it, of George W. Bush after 9-11. You're either with us or against us. He's saying that he represents the state, democracy and the survival of a great Turkey. And he's saying that those are against, who are against him are enemies of the state and they are traitors. Which side are you on? I'm trying to be the storyteller and trying not to take the side and tell the whole story, the entire story. Because once you take the side, you don't hear the other side, and more importantly, the other side does not hear you. And but there's no, this room. Is a there's no room, with all due respect. Absolutely, in, in I was just going to say that. There's it, no room for that. It's an extremely polarized society. And you know what I think? I think, you know, we have been hating each other in Turkey. All these, these polars have been eating, eat, hating each other. And now that hate turned to almost disgust. People don't want to even see the other. They don't want to cohabit with the other, which is a very, very dangerous thing. So you rather neatly dodged my whose side are I'm you trying. on question. But, <laughs> but I'm going to come back to it, because you have a history with Erdogan. I mean, back in 2012, you were a very prominent columnist with the Haber Turk newspaper. You wrote a couple of particularly sort of vitriolic columns uh, taking on Erdogan very directly. I'm just going to quote a little bit of one of them, okay. where you address him directly. And you say, so, you give the orders, my commander, but I am not listening to you anymore. We are the rest of this country. We are not going to listen to your orders anymore. See, in Erdogan's mind, that probably sounds like, uh, in a sense, you're preempting the coup. You're questioning his very legitimacy. My God, you're putting ideas in people's minds. No, not at all. It was years ago, one thing, and the second thing, it was not... Uh, about Erdogan, it was about Roboski massacre, which happened on Iraqi Turkish border, accidentally killed a dozen of kids I know, uh, on the border. But you're basically saying, you and know, I was, we, by the way, we are the rest of this country. Fired are... because of that article, very article, in uh, with a 30 second telephone you call. You were fired, my, I know. Uh, you were yeah. chucked out. Yeah. I know. So, but what then, I'm saying is, mm -hmm. you've tried to navigate, you've tried to continue writing, and you do continue writing, and yeah. you, have a, you have a prominent voice 
in and out of Turkey, but it is extraordinarily difficult to navigate Absolutely. right now. Absolutely. One thing should, you know, I feel like pointing out something. Um, this is the new fashion in media now, being against Erdogan. And it ha started after Gezi uprising. Before Gezi uprising, all these people who ha who's now criticizing Erdogan, all the intellectuals, most of the intellectuals, most of the journalists, they were praising this Turkish model. Whereas after Gezi happened, it's now all over the place. The dictator Erdogan, they're saying, you know, he's, he, they're acting as if he's the mother of all evils. Yeah, suddenly he, be he moved from being the Democrat, the moderate yeah. Islamist to and, the authoritarian. You know, you'd be surprised, but I think it's unfair to him because uh, there was something wrong with the model. It's not the man, it's the model. And nobody still takes the time to think about that model, what was wrong about that model. So you're saying which was, it was absolutely naive and wrong to ever think there was this thing called moderate Islam. Is that what you're saying? Uh, it's not that what I'm saying. It is, you know, this fantasy of, you know, perfect marriage between democracy and moderate Islam was a uh, pretty lacking vision. I suppose, in a sense, I want to get personal. You know, we've talked about the difficulty of navigating as a writer yeah. and a journalist in today's post-coup Turkey, and goodness knows it's difficult. Have you had to dial back on what you write? Are you constantly aware with every word that leaves your computer that you could be running a very personal risk? Well, this has been my story for the last 20 years, which, you know which has my entire writing life. Sure, but there are hundreds of journalists locked up right now, many of them dear friends and colleagues of yours. Yeah. That surely means that you can't say what you want to say anymore. Well, I mean, like, this is not new for Turkey to start with, but it is true that it is becoming more, you know, worrying at the moment. So, uh, yes, I do feel uh, concerned to give the British understatement. <laughs> <laughs> You are still based in Istanbul. Yes, I am. I have another place in Zagreb. Uh, now and then I go there, but I bought it like a few years ago just to concentrate because it's not only the oppression, it's not only the, you know, Turkey being threatening or what. I mean, the, uh, the turbulent times, you know, um, paralyzes you. So you are intellectually paral paralyzed in such a, such a turbulent country. So sometimes I had to... I need some peace of mind, so I go to Zagreb to write You've written novels, quite, actually. Sure. You, you, you've written quite movingly about sometimes the way you feel about Turkey, your homeland. I think yeah, well, there's one phrase I remember about you feeling almost like a relationship with a lover, a lover that has hurt you so badly and so deeply. And I just wonder if you believe that the relationship between your, uh, you and your homeland, if that amount of hurt is there, can be repaired. This has been going on since the establishment of this country. The country, this, uh, the state, not the country, but the state has never been compassionate towards people like me, uh, towards people who told the real and entire story of the country. And I mentioned almost all of them in the book, uh, the very important ones at least. Nazım Hikmet, the greatest poet of Turkish literature. Can Yücel, another great poet of Turkish, Turkish language and you know Sabahattin Ali and you know all these names all these names either have been imprisoned tortured exiled you know whatever you want so the, the this state has been quite merciless against those children of her his that loved him most is that because you are out of tune and out of step with most turks and therefore it's quite easy to isolate you and to try to pin you down and, in a sense, to silence you. I'm like, no country loves uh, their children if that children is talking about, constantly talking about the negativities of the country. So it is not about Turkey, for, for it goes for many countries, for many societies, I think. Uh -uh. I'm a writer, I mean, like, it's not easy to like a writer who writes about political stuff. No, and you take on the subjects which Turkey as a state, uh, not just any colour of government, but as a state has declared to be off limits. For example, the Armenian genocide. You know, you've taken it on in a way that most Turkish journalists and writers refuse to because they know that it could very well lead to them being locked up. You've also taken on the human rights situation in, in the Kurdish areas of Turkey repeatedly. Yeah. 
um, you are, I think you would probably call yourself a feminist in a way that upsets some Turks. No. <laughs> Certainly a human rights defender. Absolutely. So the, I'm not really defender. Yeah, I'm trying to move to the storytelling part. Uh, I am tr trying to be more on the storytelling part. In all these cases you mentioned, Armenian issue, Kurdish question, and so on and so forth, all of them uh, I wrote uh, to tell the entire story. In Armenian case, for instance, I thought the term genocide, uh, you know, stopped the conversation in between Kurdish and Turkish and Armenian people. So I tried to find another way to tell the story without mentioning that word and to tell the pain of Armenian people to Turkish people and vice versa. Uh, for Kurdish people, I tried to bring those people as, as human beings uh, for the people in the Western Turkey to see the story because I am this naive person who thinks that you know once you know the story you cannot hate a person. But, but against that you also portray a Turkish society which in some ways seems to be determined not just because of government instruction but just collectively determined to forget to be silent and, and yeah. you use this phrase about the Dubaiization of Dubaiization, Turkey, yeah. where you sort of imply that as long as people have access to shopping malls and access to comforts, they can sort of forget all of the polarizations and divisions within their country. Is that the way you feel about Turkey today? You know, Turkey is this, you know, the, the cliche definition, geographical definition is that Turkey is a bridge between Asia and Europe. So once you're on a bridge, you feel like passing through it, not really staying on it. So I always thought that Turkey, Turkey has been hurrying up, rushing, rushing the history, let's say, uh, to cross the bridge. And, you know, the, the ideology of the established uh, in the beginning was to cross the bridge to the western side, whereas in this new Turkey, the idea was cross the bridge to the other side, to the, to the eastern side. And you uh, strike me as so a deeply westernized Turk, is that? the way you see yourself? Well, I am pretty much Middle Eastern uh, in my emotional uh, world, but then, you know, uh, if you talk about realities, I'm kind of Western, I think. Well, I, I, you know, I want you to know. bring it back to politics now. You'll be delighted to know. Uh, I want to bring <laughs> it back to Mr. Erdogan and your critique of him and of his authoritarianism, which you would, I think, suggest makes his talk of democracy illegitimate. And yet, the truth is that according to all of the polling evidence in Turkey today, he is more popular and the AKP government is more popular today than it's ever been. More yeah. than two thirds of Turks appear to willingly, voluntarily support President Erdogan. How does that fit in your picture? Um, first of all, like I, I told it before and I'm repeating it again, this, uh, this book is not about Mr. Erdogan, and I am not crit criticizing personally Mr. Erdogan. I'm talking about the system, I'm talking about the ideas, the ideologies, and so on and so forth. That's, put it that's, that aside. Um, well, democracy, democracy is a funny thing. Uh, once you define it as just as the bo ballot boxes, mm. then you can get anything you want. But then it's not only ballot boxes, it's unions, it's, you know, uh, foundations, it's uh, civil, civil society, society and so on and so forth. Do you, would you draw a parallel between the, Mr. Erdogan today and, and Vladimir Putin in Russia? I mean, is that the sort of... Well, I think uh, there's, a, there's a trend in the world and you are going to go through that as well, I think, in Britain. Uh, there's a trend of orderism, you know, Putin, Erdogan, Trump. Uh, you're having a Brexit here now in, in France, they're having right-wing parties uh, rising in Austria as well. So this is a trend. Uh, and I think it represents the crisis of democracy for the entire world. And that's why Turkey is important, actually. And that's why Europe has to pay more attention to Turkey. Because if Turkish uh, democracy uh, gets damaged, I think that might have a domino effect in Europe. And you're going to see that the uh, right-wing parties in Europe will rise with the same discourse, with the same arguments that has been used in Turkey. You seem quite disillusioned with the way Europe and maybe the United States, the Western powers, have looked at Turkey in recent years. You, you, you seem to believe they've consistently misunderstood 
what is happening Not in your really. country? They, I think they, 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 they chose uh, to believe in this project of Turkish model because it fit the requirements the of the world. Uh, I mean, Turkish model? Well, uh, did you mean Islamism, by that that the moderate Islamism? Moderate Islamism the idea that Erdogan and, could be that effective bridge between Western democracy and the Arab world and could pre present, uh, yeah, in a sense, yeah. a model After of democratization. Especially, especially the fears of 9-11 was soothed with this project, which didn't really happen which didn't really work out. So, by the way, I'm feeling like the guinea pig of a, a failed experiment, a massive scale experiment. And most people in Middle East say, uh, think the same way, feel the same way. I'm like, in Egypt, people who went to Tahrir would, you know, kind of think almost the same things like uh, with me in this, on this subject, I guess. Well, a sense of betrayal? Uh, not betrayal, like, you know, uh, the, you were asking about West and my mm. dis disillusionments. Um, I think they refused to talk to secular part of the society, secular part of the politics. And they were so enthusiastic for a decade. They were so enthusiastic about this project. So they uh, fell for the narrative of, you know, the seculars of these countries are elites and they are oppressive and they are, you know, oppressing the real people of Turkey or real people of the country and so on and so forth. Uh, I think, you know, they, you know, all these people, all these intellectuals, journalists, writers, they, they should show the same enthusiasm uh, now when they're connecting, communicating with the secular um, part of the society. With you, you mean? Yeah. So, so what happens to you now? You know, you say from time to time you feel intellectually and, and, and sort of creatively paralyzed in yeah. Turkey and you have to get out. This Do you think you will end up living out of Turkey, you know, given the oh, situation today? Not. No, no, no. God forbid. No, I don't want that. Well, uh, then you might end up locked up. Uh, well, why are you keep saying that? It's not an because easy thing to talk about. Because I look at what has happened to so many about. other journalists and writers and, frankly, courageous people, as you've said, who are committed to truth-telling. And right now, in Turkey, that's a dangerous exercise. I'm not a courageous person. I'm a very good coward, actually. I'm a perfect coward. But the thing coward. is, yeah, I am. You the, know, key, you the things you've it. written? Uh, you oh, my God. I'm, uh, I'm a... Serious coward, actually. Usually this but program then... doesn't work like this. <laughs> you tell me you're very brave and I suggest you're a coward. Why are no. you telling me you're a coward? No, the, the thing is I'm writing that I'm fearing things when I'm writing. That's why I'm writing most probably. This is the way I deal with life my, in my fears. So I'm not a courageous person. So when, whenever you bring up imprisonment and so on, I go... Mm. <laughs> uh, on the other hand, uh, I don't want to be defined by courage either because that's a reducing thing, especially for a writer. And it's a you know, too much weight on one's shoulder, and then it reduces you to this person who is courageous. And there is a funny thing about being in opposition, uh, especially in Turkey nowadays, uh, even though you're oppositional, uh, whenever the political power becomes more primitive, you are becoming more primitive accordingly, and you're turning into this person who says no, no, which doesn't really require much intellectual you know, capacity. So do you think so, you're... You know, that's why I'm trying to write the whole story. That's why I'm telling that Turkey's story is far bigger than uh, AKP government and uh, current issues at the moment. Well, it's interesting you say that. So my last question is really this, whether you feel that you are going to move away from the sort of daily diet of commentary and columns and yeah. journalism and much more to your fiction, maybe yeah. more allegorical stuff, <laughs> where the, the tension with the state and with the government is less of a daily pressure. Yeah, because, you know, journal, um, journalism or, you know, articles, daily articles are for... Uh, they are more mediocre, in a way, uh, comparing to literature. And uh, when you write literature, you write these big books. So all these people who want to hate you, they have to take their time and spend <laughs> energy to, and they don't do that. So they don't see the politics actually buried in them that I secretly buried in those books. <laughs> That's a great way of putting it. Ejjeh Temel Karan, thank you very much for being on Hard Talk. Thank you. Thank Thanks you. Thanks a lot.